Today, I'm doing a 10,000 mile review on my ownership experience so far with my 2023 Subaru Outback. So if you are in the market for a Subaru or an Outback in particular, this is going to give you an in-depth overview on some of the good things about this car, some of the bad things as well. It wouldn't be an overview on everything if I didn't include the bad things as well. And of course, I'm gonna answer some of your all's questions I asked you about in a recent post. What are some things that you would like to know? This particular Outback has the 2.5 liter four cylinder naturally aspirated engine with 182 horsepower. In this option, you have the ability to get a 2.4 liter turbo engine that has 260 horsepower, so more torque, more performance. I'm gonna talk about some of the things. Do I regret not getting that turbo engine? Talk about some of the pros and cons to that and just give you guys an overall view on what my thoughts are on this particular Subaru. If you guys are new to my channel, my name is Alex. I like to share weekly videos all on Subaru related content. So if you enjoy those types of videos, click on the subscribe button down below. And if you guys learn something new and get value out of this video, I'd really appreciate it if you remember to click the like button. This is the Onyx trim level in the Outback. So there's multiple different trim levels, base, premium, the Onyx, the Wilderness, the Limited and Touring. If you guys want to see in-depth details on those different trim levels, you can click on the YouTube card above and that'll share some detailed information on those to help you decide which trim level is best for you. One of the reasons why I got this specific trim level is because it has the black appearance package. I don't know about you guys, but it's not just about practicality and reliability for me. I also want something that is good to look at. And this one appeals to me because of the way it looks. I think it looks sporty but it also has the safety, the practicality, and reliability that I'm looking for in a car. So that's why I got this one. For the 23 model year, this trim level did have the optional package with the moonroof, the nav, and a system called reverse automatic braking. I opted out of those because it was about $1,800 additional to get that. And I don't use my moonroof enough for it to be something that I would pay extra for. The navigation is practically useless to me because I use Apple CarPlay on my phone and that is on all the trim levels. It doesn't matter which one you go with. And then reverse automatic braking was another one that I felt like I could live without. I still have the reverse alert. So there's an audible alert if I am backing up and it'll tell me if somebody's back behind me. Again, I didn't need that reverse automatic braking. So that was something I opted out of. Now, depending on the trim level you go with, those features are gonna be standard. And, and actually now in 2024 or the 2024 model year, I should say those features are just standard and they added a heated steering wheel and the upgraded audio system. I know a lot of people really wanted that upgraded audio system on a trim level like this. So Subaru finally addressed that. They put that in this trim level. So that is nice to see. Unfortunately, I missed out on that, but I'm perfectly okay with it because I got a really good deal on this one and it was at a much lower price because it didn't have all of those options. If you were curious, this specific 2023 Onyx without the moonroof and the added options I just mentioned was $34,720 starting out without any of the additional accessories like your all weather floor liners and such. But the, uh, the new one starting out for 2024, because it has all those standard, is $37,400. So you can see there's quite a bit of a difference there just because of what is now standard equipment on the 2024. I'm about to get into about five things that I really like on this car and five things I don't like on the car. But before that, I'm gonna answer your all's question about this non-turbo engine. We're gonna pop the hood and talk about the fuel economy and some of the details on this. Under the hood, we have the 2.5 liter naturally aspirated engine with 182 horsepower compared to the 2.4 liter turbo, which gives you 260 horsepower. That is something that you'll have to decide for yourself. Do you need that additional power? Are you hauling something? Are you towing something? The towing capabilities on this is 2,700 pounds. The turbo engine is 3,500 pounds. So depending on what you're planning to, to use your car with, that is going to be a deciding factor for you. Now for me, I'm not hauling anything except for bikes on the, the hitch rack. So I don't need anything to, to haul a ton of weight. So that's why this works for me. Also, it comes down to everything's relative to your own perspective. What are you used to? I came from a, I think it was a 1.4 liter hybrid four cylinder engine, non-turbo. And that was my Honda CRZ. So it was slow in comparison to this. But if you're coming from a truck a six cylinder, a V8, something like that, this is going to seem slow to you. So in that case, you might want to bump up to the turbo. For me, it was all about cost. If 
fuel economy and what I was going to be happy with. And the cost on a turbo engine is going to be a few thousand dollars more depending on the uh, trim level that you're comparing. And also your fuel economy is gonna be slightly different. I would say maybe only buy like anywhere from three to five miles per gallon difference. The non-turbo gets a little bit better fuel economy. Over the last 10,000 miles, I've averaged just above 25 miles per gallon. The rating on the window sticker is averaged 29 miles per gallon. And while I knew I wasn't going to be able to achieve that, I thought it would be a little bit better, maybe in the 27 to 28 range, so much closer than it is. Uh, overall, I'm still happy with this performance. I knew that my fuel economy was going to be a little bit lo lower, a little bit less than my Honda CRZ, but that's because that was a two-door hybrid, so almost uh, anything's gonna have uh, worse fuel economy than that. I already knew that, but compared to the turbo, I'm perfectly happy with uh, the sacrifice and, and the engine performance to get that little bit better fuel economy. Now let's dive into what are some of the things I like and then I'm going to follow it up with some of the things I don't like. So starting out, I really love the keyless entry. So if you heard that, the car automatically unlocked. I have the key fob in my pocket. So here's what the key fob looks like. I don't have to have it out whenever I'm entering or exiting the car. So whenever I'm exiting and I want to lock, I just put my finger on those little lines there. It locks the door. Whenever I'm approaching the car and I want to get inside, it will automatically unlock whenever I reach for the door handle. Now this only works with the key fob nearby. So somebody else can't just simply do that. They have to have the key on them in order for that to work. This also is really nice because I don't have to pull the key out to start the car. I just simply come over here, put my foot on the brake and click that push button start and the car fires up. This is also my first car that has remote start directly from the phone. So Subaru has a, they call it the My Subaru app. You can get this on 2020 and newer Subarus. If your car has the keyless entry with push button start, it is a subscription. If you're getting your car new, that's the best time to get it because they give you a discounted rate. It's 250 total for five years. That's personally what I got. And you're not under a contract. So if you sell your car, if you get rid of your car, you don't use that service like you thought you would, you can cancel it at any time and get reimbursed for a prorated difference. So that is something that I really enjoy. It's nice because we got our car back in the late fall where it had just started getting cold and having that to get the car warmed up just before you take off is really nice. With the Outback, you also have digital controls for your heated seats. So your heated seats can be controlled also from your phone. So you can turn that on before you get in the car. And then now that it's starting to get warm out, finally, we'll be able to use that to turn on the air condition as well before we hop in the car. Another feature I really enjoy on this trim level is the upholstery. This is the StarTex interior. It looks sporty, it's functional, it's not leather, it's a water repellent material made out of recycled materials, and it is very easy to keep clean. So we have Cleo in and out of our car. That's our dog, if you're unfamiliar. She's a little German short-haired pointer, and she is either back here or back here in her crate. We have the cargo tray and the, the rear seat back protector to keep all this protected and weatherproofed, but when she gets her muddy paws on this material, it comes off with water and a rag, or if you want to use some detail spray, you can, but it's very easy to keep clean. And so if you have children or pets, this is going to be much more durable than the cloth interior. That's why I chose it. Another feature that is standard on all new Subarus that I really enjoy, and now I don't know if I could ever go without, is the Apple CarPlay. So this system connects to your phone, to allow you to use your navigation, your music apps, phone call, text messaging, all of that hands-free and seamlessly connected on your device. For the 2023 Outback, it was the first one to introduce the wireless CarPlay. So if you have an older generation, you do have to connect through your USB cables down here. And then now with this new touchscreen display, they updated a lot of the controls with your heated seat controls down below here the on off button for your climate control, the fan speed controls. They made this a lot easier to use. If you want that new update, click on the YouTube card up to the right. So if you have a 2020 through 2022 Outback or Legacy, you'll be able to get that update at your dealership. And I talk about that in more detail in that video. The power lift gate was a must have for me in our next car and I'm happy to say we have it on this trim level. That can be operated with the key fob here by clicking and holding the hatch button. You can also interrupt it and close it with that same button. 
There's a button on the dash too to open and close it, but my favorite way to open this is with the hands-free sensor back here on the Subaru Star Cluster logo. So if you're loading up something like a set of golf clubs and you're holding it, but you want to open this, as long as you have your key fob nearby, you don't have to press anything, you just hover right next to it, you hear it beep, you step away, that opens up automatically, and then you can throw your golf clubs in the back. And then to give you additional room back here in the cargo area, the Outback has these quick release levers that drops the seats down. So you can do that on either side, drops them down completely flat without having to reach up and click the button. I could talk all day about all the good things on this car, but it wouldn't be a full review if I didn't also include some of the bad things. So one of the really good things about this car that is also kind of a negative that I've experienced are these headlights. So I really love these headlights because they're very bright. They're also steering responsive. So if you're driving on back roads, the headlights will turn in the direction that you're steering. Now, while that may be good for visibility and compared to my previous car that had halogen lights, the visibility is really good. There's also some negatives to that. And that is these lights are so bright that even when my lights are on low beams, sometimes people think that my high beams are on and they're flashing their lights at me. So if you've experienced that driving your Subaru, let me know. Subaru does have high beam assist, which will automatically drop your lights down to the, the low beam setting whenever you're driving towards somebody at night. But I've honestly never really found the need to keep my high beams on because the low beams are so bright. Something else I'm not a huge fan of that I think could have been done better are these gloss black plastic materials. This collects a lot of dust. And so having a microfiber is almost necessary to keep that all cleaned off and looking polished, both on the plastic materials and on your touchscreen display. And you also have to worry about scratches, these little fine scratches on the gloss black material. Mine's not too bad right now, but there are things on here that are, are going to get scratched up over time. And I wish they would have replaced this with a matte black finish instead of the gloss black. The position of the USB inputs, the wireless charging pad, and where your phone is held is in an awkward spot in my opinion. You have the gear shift lever so close to this that when your phone is in here, it's, it's a very tight space and so it's hard to get your phone down in there. What I think could have been done better is moving all of this over through the over to the center console right in here you have these holes right here if you do need to charge your phone with the cable that you can have your your phone in here or if you have the wireless charging pad you can use that now another thing to note on that wireless charging pad i spent a little over 300 dollars getting this because i was really excited about the wireless apple carplay so i just wanted to prevent having any cables and clutter up here and what i've found is that the performance on this wireless charging pad has not been ideal for me. And that is because, probably because I'm using my phone also for wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. So it's using a lot of battery life to control those multiple apps all simultaneously. And so the charger really only maintains my charge level. It doesn't charge up my phone, or at least it doesn't charge it up as quickly as I would like with the hard wire or the cable into the USB-A or USB-C, my phone actually charges up much quicker than it does with the wireless charging pad. So that's just a quick note on that. You guys may experience something a little bit different, but I'm not 100% satisfied with the wireless charging pad like I thought I would be. This next one will surely spark some feelings for most, and that has to do with the seatbelt alarm. So I'll take my seatbelt off for just a second. I'll speed up here. You'll hear it start going off really loud, even whenever I come to a complete stop. And you think, oh, well, if I put it in park, that'll shut off. I'm just getting my mail. Open the door. Nope, it is still going off. You have to either put your seatbelt back on or shut the car off. My complaint isn't that the seatbelt alarm shouldn't exist because I do think that it should, but I don't think that it should have the same sequence that it has right now where it will still go off even if you're at a complete stop or even when the car is in park. So that to me, I think is a, a, uh, a fault that the Subaru seatbelt alarm has and could be improved upon. 
That covers it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed this and found value in it. If you did, please be sure to click the like button. If you haven't done so already and you enjoy videos like this, click on the subscribe button down below. I hope you guys have a great day and I will see you in the next one.